The Living Faith Means Living Justly program is a series of talks based on scriptures and Catholic social teaching. And it aims to provide Catholics who wish to engage in work for justice and peace and care for creation with a solid understanding of what our faith teaches as a starting point for a Christian response to justice issues in the world today. The programme was developed as a foundational training for individuals and parishes who wish to set up or participate in faith and justice groups. The overall aim of the programme is to promote just living, either as individuals or as Christian communities. The presentations will be delivered by Bishop Patrick Harrington, SMA, and by myself, Mr. Jerry Ford, Justice Officer at the SMA Justice Office. Already in the first presentation about justice in the Old Testament, we saw clearly that living faith and acting justly were closely linked. In fact, they are the same. One cannot truly exist without the other. In the very first slide we looked at, it emphasised that justice had to do with being faithful to a relationship. There must exist a right relationship with God, with our neighbour, our community, and also with the world or the environment in which we live. So now we move on to look at what the New Testament has to say about justice. We will examine how the life and example of Jesus influences and enhances our understanding of justice and acting justly. We will see how the New Testament enhances our understanding of the right relationships that we as Christians are commissioned to establish. Jesus is the fulfilment, the culmination of three tendencies of the Jewish search for God, for our understanding of who God is. Jesus is the fulfilment of three tendencies. The Mosaic Law, the Mosaic Law made laws trying to impart justice and to promote cult. Secondly, the fulfilment of the prophets, those who looked forward to the coming of the Messiah. He would be the definitive act of redemption. And it is the culmination of all the literature that we call the sapiential literature, which imparted human divine wisdom. And it is clear that God made Jesus Christ our wisdom, our righteousness, our sanctification and redemption, as St. Paul puts it. And John's Gospel says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God sent his Son into the world not to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through him. And this link with the Old Testament is reinforced by Jesus himself. He said that he had come not to abolish the law and the prophets, but to fulfill them. Think not that I have come to abolish the law and the prophets. I have come not to abolish them, but to fulfill them. And in this fulfillment he came, he called it the gospel of the kingdom. He came to announce the gospel of the kingdom. He went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom. Matthew chapter 9. Now this phrase, the kingdom of God, is mentioned 122 times in the gospel and 90 times on the lips of Jesus himself. Kingdom. In English, it refers to a territory or to subjects ruled by a king. But the Jewish understanding is a little bit different, the Semitic meaning. Kingdom means a process of ruling, a process of reigning, a state of being king. In the Old Testament, they were expecting salvation to come, expecting 
as Daniel and the rest of them said, that they call eschatological expectations. In other words, the Lord would come and the rule of Yahweh would be established and all people would accept him. And this, of course, would take some time, the reign to come about. And that is why there are two aspects to kingdom. There is the reign that is going on, the process, but it will culminate on the last day, the day of judgment, when all resistance to Yahweh would yield to his power. Jesus took cognizance of this, but he wanted to modify the expectations and the fear of the last day. And instead of putting the fulfillment exclusively at the end of time, he claimed that the kingdom had already come with him, that was on its way, that it was his ministry, his reign. And he interpreted activities as signs of the kingdom. For example, he said, wherever you see the healing of the sick taking place, there is a sign of the kingdom. Wherever you see the hungry being fed, there you have the reign of Christ. Wherever you see the powers of evil being confronted, there is the reign of Christ. So there is, in John's Gospel particularly, a here and now aspect of kingdom. It is not just something that will be accomplished in the last days. Wherever justice, peace, and joy is present, there is the kingdom of God. There the reign of Christ is present. That is a big change he made, that the present is important, the reign at the moment. There will be, of course, the last day, there will be an accounting and the final judgment, but uh, there's a, a, a link between what is happening now and what will happen on the last day. So I think we look at it and we try to keep both aspects in mind, the here and now, the importance of the present and working towards the culmination on the last day. What are the teachings of this kingdom? Where do we find the teachings of Christ? Where do we find the teachings about the kingdom? Well, the charter, if you like, is the Sermon on the Mount, the Beatitudes. They are the descriptions of the ideal Christian. It's like wearing an identity badge, your name and what you stand for. What we stand for is what Christ taught us in the Sermon on the Mount, the Beatitudes. And these are, Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are the gentle. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for uprightness. Blessed are the merciful. Blessed are the pure in heart. Blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are those who are persecuted in the cause of uprightness. The kingdom of heaven is theirs. So those who try to live to up to this ideal, the kingdom of heaven belongs to them. And another core text, the text of the Magnificat, when things are turned upside down, the values of this world are challenged by these values of Christ. My soul glorifies the Lord, my spirit rejoices in God my Saviour. He looks on his servant in her lowliness, henceforth all ages will call me blessed. The Almighty works marvels for me, holy is his name. His mercy is from age to age on those who fear him. He puts forth his arm and strength and scatters the proud hearted. He casts the mighty from their thrones and raises the lowly. He fills the starving with good things, sends the rich away empty. He protects Israel his servant, remembering his mercy, the mercy he promised to our fathers, to Abraham and to his sons forever. So there you have the charter, the teachings in the Beatitude and in the Magnificat. 
But like every charter, there must be a programme. The programme of the ministry is announced by Jesus himself in the synagogue when he stood up in his own hometown of Nazareth. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to captives and sight to the blind, to set free the oppressed and announce that the time has come when the Lord will save his people. That's his program. If you like a program for government in his kingdom. Bringing good news to poor, liberty to captives in whatever way one is taken prisoner, whether it's addiction or otherwise, setting the oppressed free, so many, announcing that the time has come for a change of heart. And Jesus showed a special preference for social outcasts in his ministry, for political and social outcasts. For example, the incident of the paralyzed man, who he was considered to be a great sinner. But he said to him, Jesus, I tell you, get up, pick up your bed and go home. The outcasts, Jesus associated with them. Why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and other outcasts, they asked. And then, of course, a woman who was considered an outcast because of her ailment. She touched his cloak and her bleeding stopped at once. And a leper came to him, beseeching him, and kneeling said to him, If you will, you can make me clean. Moved with pity, he stretched out his hand and touched him and said to him, I will be clean. And immediately the leprosy left him and he was made clean. Leprosy, considered person with leprosy, an outcast, away from the ordinary community. So Jesus had time for all of these. He wasn't slow either in criticizing the established order and the ruling classes. This is well documented in various references there in the Gospels. And of course, the members of the established order, they felt threatened as a result. You Pharisees cleanse the outside of the cup and of the dish, but inside you are full of extortion and wickedness. You fools, did not he who made the outside make the inside also? And then, of course, it turns our human value and our way of organizing upside down when he says, anyone who wants to be great among you must be your servant. And anyone who wants to be first among you must be the slave of all. Jesus was also critical of accumulation of excessive wealth and he warned about the dangers in Luke 6. Woe to you who are full now, for you will be hungry. Watch and be on your guard against avarice of any kind, for life does not consist in possessions, even when someone has more than he needs. Think of the ravens, they do not sow nor reap, they have not storehouses and no barns, yet God feeds them. Think of the flowers. No, set your hearts on his kingdom and these other things will be given to you as well. There we have an emphasis on priorities, having our perspective clear. Seek you first, the kingdom of God and all these other things will be added unto you. Jesus also showed scant concern for legislation and ritual and norms that obstruct human contact. He argued that the norms of legal purity can never replace the norms of fundamental moral conduct. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites! You clean the outside of the cup and the dish, but inside they are full of greed 
and self-indulgence. And you know the pride of place that the Sabbath had in the life of the Jewish people. But Jesus was ready to say, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. And perhaps the most striking identification with the poor is the description of the last judgment, which we find in Matthew 25. Come you that are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. Truly I tell you, just as you did it to one of these, the least of my brethren, you did it to me. In many ways, the most significant text in the New Testament. The criteria of how we will be judged and how we have lived our lives. So we talked about the teachings of Jesus in the Beatitudes and in the a core texts of the Magnificat. We talked about the program of government, the program which he laid out and which he implemented in his own life and wants us who are on mission, all of us on mission, his followers to do the same. And in carrying out this, we need an attitude. We need the correct attitude, our spirit. And he shows this again himself by his words and especially by his example. Truly I tell you, unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. He poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. There you have the Son of God getting down on his knees, washing the feet of others. The attitude of service, of humility, and the simplicity of the little child. Unless you become as little children, you shall not enter the kingdom of heaven. Moving on in the New Testament, we come to the letter of James. And James is a very practical person, and he describes the just individual as, and I quote him, the one who practices religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father, this is the person. The person who visits orphans and widows in their affliction and keeps oneself unstained from the world. He also warns James in his letter, I, he, at least he encourages the wealthy to use their wealth to help those who are in need and to give effective assistance. Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? What good is it? Faith without action. And the Acts of the Apostles, another book of the New Testament, it shows how the early church developed these ideals and even tried to put them into practice. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. Key phrase there is, as any had need. The basic concern of the early church is and was that nobody should be in need. St. Paul tries to advise in his letters, the people of Corinth particularly, that he was not against wealth, 
but he was against the accumulation to the extent that people round about were in need and hungry. So he urges them in the letter to the Corinthians to give their surplus and give what they can of, of what they have to help others, to help them when they are in need. And the idea of community is there strong also in the Acts of the Apostles, where people share, where people live together, where people are as one. And this idea of community has been very strong in ages since, in one expression or another. St. Paul, the great champion of freedom, he wants people to be free from oppressive structures of the law. He says that this freedom has been won for us by the death and resurrection of Jesus. For freedom Christ has set us free. Stand fast therefore and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. Paul says again, all of us are equal. All of us are free. Whether we are Jew or Greek, slave or freeman, man or woman. The redemption which Jesus has done for us is about the removal of barriers, breaking down obstacles that separate people. For he is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down the dividing wall of hostility, so making peace and thereby bringing the hostility to an end. And then the element of creation, which Jesus recognized during his life and which we have seen rooted in the Old Testament. Jesus himself looked around and he saw many natural elements that cheered his own heart and helped him in his ministry. He could interpret nature. He was a knowledgeable interpreter of nature. He illustrated his parables, his teaching, his stories with things taken from nature, like the lost sheep, the sower going out to sow the seed, the small mustard seed growing, the parable of the darnel, the weeds growing up with the, with the good wheat. I am the, the vine, you are the branches. All of these things taken from nature. The great teacher looking at the birds to illustrate the idea to be free and not to be hampered and pulled down. Look at the sparrows. The tree itself can be told by its fruit. This is the one that struck St. James so much. Faith without action. The fruit that comes with what is a tree is all about. He asks us then, we who are his followers, to treat creation with respect. To look at people with respect. Not to be categorizing people into various outcasts and sinners and useless and this and that. He tells us we must always act as carers, our brother's keeper, yes, but also as carers for creation, to bring all things together in Christ, he tells us, in himself, to bring about true harmony. Because as the scripture tells us, a letter St. Paul to the Ephesians, God set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to gather up all things to him, things in heaven and things on earth. The creation itself will be set free from its bondage to decay and obtain the glorious liberty of the children of God. We know that the whole of creation has been groaning in travail together until now, and not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, grown inwardly as we await for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. And then the great dream, I saw a new heaven and a new earth. God lives among human beings. He will make his home among them. There will be no more death, 
sadness or pain, the world of the past has gone. And St. Paul emphasizes very much the attitude of which we go about establishing this kingdom in bringing about the reign of Christ. We too are to be humble like the Son of God himself. Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. And being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even death on a cross. That famous text from the letter to the Philippians, Paul is speaking about an emptying out, a kenosis of Jesus himself when he, the Son of God, became man in the incarnation. And this kenosis shows a great sense of solidarity, solidarity with the poor, solidarity with us humans, God taking on the radical form of a human being. So it is clear that for us who try to continue his mission of justice, peace, and the integrity of creation, we should approach it with humility, humility and service. They are the key attitudes we are to have. And then when people see someone who is humbly presenting, but at the same time with conviction, that can win hearts and minds. So in conclusion, our task as Christians is to orientate ourselves constantly to the vision of reality which we have seen in the Bible. Jesus himself had a wonderful vision, a vision for which he lived, worked, suffered and died. And he has commissioned us to carry on this vision and to make the kingdom present wherever we live and work. Jesus does not guarantee success, but he does expect us to witness to his kingdom and to make it felt by our concern for action, for justice and peace and joy. And we do this in our homes, in our community and in the places where we work. Our task is to be faithful to the vision of Christ ourselves and to radiate it in a world that often seems depressed and even hopeless. We are important and God takes our cooperation seriously. Our actions here on earth do count. The new heaven and the new earth is not predetermined. What happens in and to this world is not irrelevant. And what is to be transformed is our world, the one that humans have designed and co-create. And it is from this that the new earth and the new heaven will emerge. It will come about in God's own time, as a time when he decides to put an end to the old. <laughs>